Welcome back to immunology lecture number two. Let's not waste any time. Let's dive in to our very next question. So as always, go ahead and pause the video, and then you can come back when you're ready to discuss the correct answer. So the correct answer here is B. MHC1 is associated with the beta-2 microglobulin. So let's take a look at MHC1 and MHC2. Now, since this stuff is a lot of comparing one and the other, let's do a side-by-side -side comparison, okay? So that's what I wanna do with you here today. First, I wanna ask you though, what genes encode for the MHC? The answer is the HLA genes, and you'll see what I mean in a second. Anatomically speaking, the MHC1 is composed of one long chain and one short chain whereas MHC2 is composed of two chains as well, an alpha chain and a beta chain, but they are of equal length. So remember that, MHC1, two chains, one long, one short, MHC2, two chains, same length. Now, if we compare the different loci of MHC1 and MHC2, we've got the following. On MHC1, we've got this on HLAA, HLAB, and HLAC. MHC2, on the other hand, is on HLADP, HLADQ, and HLA-DR. Now, there's a little trick here, very simple. If they ask you uh, about the loci and MHC1 and MHC2, you don't have to really remember a ton, but one thing that can help you at least narrow down your options is that when it comes to MHC1, the HLA is followed by one letter. So I mentioned MHC1, HLAA, HLAB, HLAC. MHC1, HLAA, B, or C. MHC2, the number two, two letters. HLADP, HLADQ. HLADR. Okay, simple trick. Hopefully, if you get a question on this, that'll help you at least narrow down and eliminate some of the distractors. Now, keep in mind that MHC binds to TCR, the T cell receptor, and CD8. MHC2 binds to the T cell receptor and CD4. Now, MHC1 is expressed on all nucleated cells, APCs, and on platelets. MHC2, on the other hand, is expressed only on APCs. Very important you remember that differentiation. Now, how does each one of these function? MHC1 presents an endogenous antigen to CD8 cytotoxic T cells. MHC2 presents an exogenous antigen to the CD4 helper T cells. MHC1, endogenous CD8. MHC2, exogenous CD4. You also wanna be able to decipher between the ways by which each is involved in antigen loading. So with MHC1, here, the antigen is loaded onto MHC1 in the rough ER after its delivery via the transporter associated with antigen processing. Whereas in MHC2, here, the antigen is loaded following the release of an invariant chain in an endosome. Now let's dive into our very next question. Go ahead and pause the video, try and figure this one out, and then come back when you're ready to discuss the correct answer. So the correct answer here is E, DR3, okay? So you're going to want to know the important HLA subtypes and their associated diseases. So let's take a look at these right now. Unfortunately, this is simply something you're gonna have to memorize, but this is something that works great with your Anki cards, your index cards, or if you wanna create a PowerPoint and just quiz yourself with yourself or a partner. So these are excellent little facts to continuously sort of beat into your memory because otherwise you probably forget them. So let's go over them. First, we have the a3, what is A3 associated with? Do you know? It is hemochromatosis. B8 is associated with a few diseases. Most importantly, we have Graves, we have myasthenia gravis, and we have Addison disease. B27 is associated with reactive arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, as well as IBD-associated arthritis conditions. The DQ2, DQ8 is associated with what? Celiac disease. The GR2 is associated with multiple sclerosis, SLE, good pasture syndrome, and hay fever. DR3 is associated with type 1 diabetes, Graves' disease, SLE, Addison disease, and Hashimoto thyroiditis. Now, DR4 is also associated with type 1 diabetes. So DR3 and 4 are both associated with DM1. DR4 is also associated with RA and Addison disease. Okay, so if we look at the um, similarities here, DR3 is and DR4 both are associated with type 1 diabetes as well as Addison disease. Now, the final subtype, DR5, is associated with Hashimoto thyroiditis, and that uh, is, a, is a similarity between DR3 and DR5, because DR3 
is also associated with Hashimoto thyroiditis. DR5, it's single thing that we want to keep in mind is that it is associated with Hashimoto thyroiditis. All right, let's go on to our very next question. Go ahead and pause the video. Come back when you're ready to discuss the answer. So the correct answer here is B, IL-2. Okay, so let's take a look at the natural killer cells, how they function, and of course, we'll look at the proteins that can alter the way they work. So first, I want you to remember that natural killer cells are classified as group one innate lymphocytes, and they respond quickly. They function in killing infected cells, and they're also able to detect and control cancerous cells very early on. And they do their killing with the use of granzymes and perforin, and these help to induce apoptosis. When a cell puts out nonspecific activation signals, or let's say a cell is lacking MHC1 on its surface, this is going to induce the natural killer cell to kill that particular cell. It can also kill via antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity, where a CD16 binds the FC region of bound IgG, thus activating that natural killer cell. Now, its activity, and this is important, this has to do with the question here, the activity of the natural killer cell can be enhanced or increased by interleukins 2 and 12, as well as by interferons alpha and beta. All right, now that is some very important information that you must know about natural killer cells. Let's move on to the very next question. As always, go ahead and pause the video, come back when you're ready to discuss the answer. All right, and the correct answer to this question is C, thymic medulla. So let's have a look here at T cell differentiation. And I wanna take you through the steps involved in going from a T cell precursor in the bone marrow all the way to the action of a T cell in the peripheral blood. So first, in the bone marrow, we've of course got our T cell precursor. It's gonna move into the cortex of the thymus and it's going to contain certain surface proteins. It's gonna contain the CD4 surface protein, the CD8 surface protein, and a T cell receptor that binds MHC1, and MHC2. Here we undergo positive selection, whereby the T cells that are expressing T cell receptors capable of binding self MHC on cortical epithelial cells will survive. This is known as positive selection. Then we move into the medulla of the thymus, where T cells expressing T cell receptors with a high affinity for self antigens will either undergo apoptosis or they'll become regulatory T cells. Now, at this point, we've got both CD8 and CD4 T cells. Those then move into the lymph nodes. And here, helper T cells secrete a variety of proteins that will induce different types of T cells, like Th1 and Th2 cells, which then secrete a variety of proteins in the blood to induce certain functions. As an example, the production of Th1 cells will lead to the secretion of IL-2 and interferon gamma. These then go on to activate macrophages and cytotoxic T cells in the blood. Th2 cells will secrete a variety of interleukins, like IL-4, 5, 6, IL-10, and IL-13, and these will activate eosinophils and increase immunoglobulin E. Now, don't forget the interferons, which include interferon alpha, beta, and gamma, are part of the innate system, and these are going to work by interfering with DNA and RNA viruses, as well as in activating anti-tumor immunity. Now, these can be used therapeutically in cases of uh, conditions like chronic HBV, Hep B virus, uh, Kaposi sarcoma, hairy cell leukemia, renal cell carcinoma, condyloma acuminata, uh, malignant melanomas, MS, as well as CGD. Now their side effects are pretty drastic and they can include things like neutropenia, myopathy, and interferon-induced autoimmunity. So that's very important to keep in mind those side effects. Now there's something known as thymus-independent and thymus-dependent antigens. Thymus-independent antigens are antigens that lack a peptide component and therefore cannot be presented by MHC to the T cells. Now, on the other hand, we have the thymus dependent antigens and these contain a protein component and thus direct contact between B cells and TH cells results in class switching and immunologic memory. Now, before we go on to our next question, I wanna do a quick review of the roles and the functions of regulatory T cells and cytotoxic T cells because these are very commonly tested topics. So. I want you to keep in mind that this is the way you want to be going through a review of your step one and your step two CK, even your step three information. So if I say something like regulatory T cell, how much information can you 
theoretically rattle off. So I'm talking to you right now, you watching this, I'm saying to you, tell me what you know about regulatory T cells. How much can you tell me? This is how you wanna be able to look through your first aid and see a bullet point and be able to rattle off information. So for example, the more you can rattle off when a simple term is mentioned, the better off you'll be. So let's say I say to you regulatory T cells. Now, what can you rattle off right now? So I'm gonna give you a few seconds. I want you to think about this and rattle off as much as you can to yourself. So go ahead, I'm gonna pause for a couple seconds. I want you to just blurt it out, boom, boom, boom. So you're either talking still or you're sitting there and you're kind of not sure what to say. So if you could rattle off a bunch of info, fantastic. If you can't, that's okay. It just means you need to start thinking in terms of being able to hear something like a fact, seeing a bullet point in first aid, seeing a bunch of information that doesn't really make sense and then being able to sort of elaborate. So let's do that. So let's look at regulatory and cytotoxic T cells. So if I say regulatory T cells, what you wanna say is something like this. These will work to maintain specific immune tolerance via the suppression of CD4 and CD8 T cell effector functions. They are identified by the expression of CD3, CD4, CD25, and FOXP3. Regulatory T cells that are activated will produce certain anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-10 and TGF-beta. Cytotoxic T cells are responsible for killing cells by inducing what? Just talked about this, apoptosis. They'll kill neoplastic cells, they'll kill donor graft cells, and they will kill virus infected cells via this apoptotic inducing function. Now, they'll also work by releasing cytotoxic granules that contain preformed proteins like perforin. Don't forget, of course, that these cytotoxic T cells have the CD8 surface protein that binds to MHC1 on that virus infected cell. So, you see what I did there? I took the term regulatory T cell and cytotoxic T cell. And I sort of just went off on a tangent. That's sort of what you want to do because the more you can go off on a tangent, guess what? The easier it's going to be for you to pull that information when you see a question on exam day. All right, let's do the next question. So as always, go ahead and pause and then come on back when you're ready to discuss the correct answer. All right, so the correct answer here is CD80 slash 86. Now, if you don't know what that is, that's okay. There's a different name for it, and I'll tell you about that very shortly. So let's take a look at B and T cell activation and class switching. Very important, high yield stuff, especially as it relates to immunology. So remember, this stuff is actually pretty straightforward. So let's just start with T cell activation. So in T cell activation, it all starts when a dendritic cell engulfs and processes an antigen. We call this our very first step, engulfing and processing an antigen. In step two, the antigen is presented on MHC1 or 2 of the dendritic cell and is recognized by the T cell receptors on the T cell, which remember, MHC1 matches up with what? CD8. MHC2 matches up with what? CD4. And that is, of course, on the T cell. Now, in the third step, the second signal between the dendritic cell and the T cell occurs when the B7 protein, which is also known as CD80 slash 86, I told you. So this question, CD8086, is actually talking about the B7 protein. So you need to know these interchangeable terms. So let me just go back there. The second signal between the dendritic cell and the T cell occurs when that B7 protein, which CD8086, on that dendritic cell interacts with CD28 of the native T cell. B7, CD28. This leads to the activation of the T cell. An activated helper T cell produces cytokines while an activated cytotoxic T cell can go on to recognize and kill a virus infected cell. Now let's take a look at B cell activation and class switching before going to our next question. So we already have our helper T cells and in the case of B cells, the B cell receptor will take in an antigen and then present it on MHC2, which is recognized by the T cell receptor on that helper T cell. Now we have a CD40 receptor on the B cell and that binds to the CD40 ligand on the T cell. So, one more time. We have a CD40 receptor on the B cell that binds to the CD40 ligand on the T cell. After this, the T cells will secrete cytokines that will help determine the immunoglobulin class switching of the B cells. At this point, B cells are activated, undergo class switching and affinity maturation, and the process of antibody production starts. All right, hopefully that all made sense to you. If it didn't, go ahead and listen to it again. Fairly straightforward stuff. Of course, you should be following all along in your first aid because that will give you the visual and I'll just walk you through it. All right, 
Let's go on to our very next question. As always, go ahead and pause, try and figure it out, and then come on back when you're ready. All right, the correct answer to this question is E. So let's go to the very next slide here. I want you to follow along with this, or you can follow along in your first aid books or whatever you're using, um, just so that I can walk you through this and you can actually visualize it. So this stuff is relatively straightforward. You wanna make sure that you have a very good understanding of the basic anatomy and function of the antibody, which is what we're looking at here. So we've got our antigen binding site, of course, here at the end, where we've got our variable heavy chain region and variable light chain region. Now remember that the antigen binding site is specific for only one antigen per B cell. The FC region, which is known as the constant region, contains a carboxy terminal, binds complement, and determines the isotype. Now we've got a macrophage binding site here between CH2 and CH3 regions in the FC region of the antibody, which you can see here right on this picture. Now, Antibody diversity, very, very important you understand antibody diversity and how it's established. And it is going to be established in a couple ways. So the first is simply via random recombination of the light chain, which is the VJ or the heavy chain, the VDJ genes. So let me just say that again, via random recombination of the light chain or heavy chain genes. The second could be via random addition of nucleotides to DNA via the terminal deoxynucleotidal transferase and the third way is via random recombination of heavy chains with light chains, a process that is antigen independent. Now, antibody specificity, which is antigen dependent, is established via either isotype switching, which is of the constant region, or somatic hypermutation and affinity maturation. That is of the variable region. All right, make sure you know this stuff. Very straightforward, very simple, but could be an easy point on exam day. All right. Let's do one more question before we call it quits with lecture number two. So as always, go ahead and pause and then come on back when you're ready to discuss the correct answer. The correct answer to this question is BIGA. So let's talk about the different immunoglobulin isotypes. These are simple and if you get a question on this information, it really should be an easy point. So let's look at the high yield points that you need to know for each. Now, one important reminder is that when we're talking about binding and interactions between antigens and immunoglobulins, avidity, which is a term that a lot of students seem to confuse, this refers to the overall binding strength of antibody antigen interactions. So the stronger that binding, the stronger that interaction, the greater the avidity. Affinity refers to the individual antibody antigen interaction. So if they want you to talk strength of the binding, that's avidity. All right, let's talk first about IgG. IgG is the main antibody responsible for the secondary response to the presence of an antigen. Not only is this the main antibody in the secondary response, it's also our most abundant isotype in the serum. That's important, circle that, highlight that. IgG is the most abundant isotype in the serum. Another unique feature of IgG is that it's the only one that crosses the placenta and is therefore responsible for, for providing uh, infants with passive immunity. But I want you to take note that this type of immunity, although present at birth, does begin to wear off after birth. Now, in addition to these unique features of IgG, it also fixes complement, opsonizes bacteria, and neutralizes bacterial toxins and viruses. So IgG, super important. Next up, we have IgA. This is found in the mucous membranes, and it prevents the attachment of both viruses and bacteria at the mucous membranes. Now, as opposed to IgG, IgA does not fix complement. Let me repeat that. IgA does not fix complement. IgG does. Now, in circulation, IgA is a monomer, but when it's secreted, it contains something known as a J-chain, and it is at that point a dimer. Now, IgA is produced in the GI tract by pyre patches and is therefore important in the protection against gut infections. Now, an important point to keep in mind is that IgA is actually the most abundantly produced immunoglobulin, but it has lower serum concentrations. So, we've come to this sort of weird scenario where IgA, IgG is the most abundant in the serum, but IgA is the most abundantly produced. So, if, if the question says, what's the most abundantly produced immunoglobulin? IgA. But if they say, which one is most abundant in the serum? IgG. Do not forget that. Super easy point, 
But if you don't remember these little details, it can totally screw you up when it comes time to getting through a vignette and going two, three, four, five levels deep, all right? Next up, we have IgE. Now, IgE binds basophils and mast cells, cross-linking when exposed to an allergen. Now, it mediates type 1 hypersensitivity reactions by releasing inflammatory mediators such as what? The big one is histamine. Now, if you get a question asking you about parasitic infections, and they say what immunoglobulin is most abundant, the answer here is IgE. IgE is going to be your main protector in, in, in parasitic infections via the activation of eosinophils. Next up, we have IgM. Now, IgM is the immunoglobulin produced immediately in response to an antigen. Now, this brings up an important question because I remember I just said IgG is the main antibody responsible for the, the response to the presence of an antigen, but that's the secondary response, so later on. But IgM is going to be produced immediately in response to an antigen. Now, it fixes complement just like IgG, so there's that sort of similarity there as well. Now, it is a monomer on B cells, and it is a pentamer with a J chain when it's secreted. And this pentamer structure that it has, that it creates, is really important because it enables really robust binding to an antigen as that humoral response begins to evolve over time. Now, IgD, this immunoglobulin is found in the serum, and it's on the surface of many B cells, but we don't know a lot about what it does, uh, how it works, etc. Therefore, there's not a lot to know, and chances are you're not going to get a question on this. Keep that, keep that really important uh, fact in mind that don't waste too much time you know, losing sleep over IgD. Just remember it's found in the serum and it's found on some surface, the surfaces of some B cells. Okay, a couple of final points to remember about the different immunoglobulin isotypes. So remember, any of these can exist as a monomer. Now, IgM and IgD, I wanna point these out. These are important as it relates to B cells because a mature but naive B cell has those two proteins expressed on their surface before activation. So if we have a mature but naive B cell here, it's got two proteins sticking out, what are they gonna be? IgM and IgD. Which one of those, we don't know how it fully works? IgD, okay, so that's really important to keep in mind. Now, another thing I wanna point out is that immunoglobulins can differentiate in the germinal centers of lymph nodes by what we call isotype switching into IgA, IgE, or IgG secreting plasma cells. This is induced by the CD40 ligand and by a variety of different cytokines. All right, that concludes lecture number two. Uh, go ahead and check out lecture number three when you're ready to move forward with some more questions.